Come on, anybody else? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for just allowing us to come in your house tonight, Lord, to gather around your people. The Lord, we come to you today and hopefully in prayer. The Lord, we know that uh, we seek to throw grace the word of God and hear our prayers. Lord, we uplift all the prayer requests you here today. That should be a little right prayer tonight, Lord. That should just help them. Lord, make a wise decision about his job. Lord, that should be with the Williams family, Lord, as they make the move. I should be very hard for to see that carry that torch for that family. Lord, I pray that you have an easy transition between Virginia Beach and here. Lord, I pray that you be with uh, the Puckett family today. Lord, and, Lord, you know that need, you know the situation. Lord, I pray that uh, you be the deputy, Lord, in our own county, our own home. Lord, I should give that family, Lord. Um, what tragedy it is. This respect of these uh, kids today that just have no respect for authority. Lord, that you may mention, Lord, as uh, times we wax worse, Lord, as, as closer we get to you coming back, Lord, we know that we should not be surprised, but Lord, use the situation to gather this community around. You have that family, Lord, they need uh, peace tonight, Lord, and know that you are uh, their, their Lord and Savior, Father. Lord, may uh, tragic event be turned into a great thing. Lord, I pray that you can be with our uh, pastor and Lord, as they're, as they're uh, witnessing and ministering to others, Lord, down in Southwest Virginia and Kentucky. And Lord, I ask you just to be with our church. Be with us tonight, Lord, as we can study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, take your Bibles if you can to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 to 20. Um, I want to, listen, we've been on this, uh, we've been on this uh, church study, and we've been on um, this uh, Think about all about grace, and and that's all great. And you know, we, we can preach and we can talk about all the rosiness of the Bible and all the rosiness of how great God is, and He is great, amen. But we have to understand with the things of God, there's a principality and there's a power that is trying to go against God, and that's the devil himself, amen. Now, listen, now if we don't, so we can study God. And we ought to know God the way God knows us. So God knows us. You know, He knows every hair of one of my head. He knows how many hairs I lost today. Amen. He knows all about me. And we ought to get to know God and try to know God just as well. He knows me. But we'll never get to truly understand the awesomeness and the power of God the way we ought to until we get to heaven. Amen. But we ought to strive to know that. But at the same time, we got to know who our enemy is. We gotta know who we're, we're facing battles with each and every day. Romans chapter eight talks about this great battle that takes place the second you wake up. We're not even that, even where you're asleep. You know, let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone to sleep and felt like you've never gone to sleep and you wake up so tired? You are. I'm gonna sit here and tell you. Even Satan, while you're sleeping, wants to defeat you. You ever felt like he just with you battle at night? You know, when you're at night. The, the, the secrets come out. The darkest times in your life are usually at night. It seems like Satan wants to just battle you right before you try to get rest. And Satan will not let you rest. Amen? I mean, we have to know who Satan is. We have to know how he deals with things. We have to know how he destroys people. And how he's destroying churches today. Because I'm going to be honest with you. Things are going too good at Grace Chapel. Amen? Seems like everything is going too smoothly here. Now, we, we've had battles. We've had some ups and downs. But I'm going to tell you something. As things progress, we have got to, we just can't be roller coasting on this great wind and just setting our sail thinking that we're not going to face these battles. Because I'm going to tell you something. I've been in church too long. I've seen churches go from the, the, the very bottom to the very top and then right back down to the bottom. Because they want to be on this emotional high, they want to be on the spiritual high, and they don't think that that's ever going to come down to a crashing end. It does. And I hate to be a realist tonight, and I'm not trying to be cynical, I'm not trying to be... But as long as imperfect people are in churches, you're going to deal with Satan. And you're going to deal with people that you would think literally came from the pits of hell. And I'm not trying to be funny today, I'm just trying to be serious. 
The worst battles I've ever faced in my entire life have never been on the outside. The worst battles I've ever faced in my life came from the church and the people in the church. And there's troublemakers that Satan will send to destroy our ministry. Amen? And Paul says in the great book of Romans, here in chapter 16, we better be careful. And we have to be keeping in the service because let me tell you something. God expects you, and you have an obligation unto God and under this church to protect our flock. It is not a pastor's job to be 100% watchman for this flock. You have children in our ministry. You have children that need to learn about God. And we need to stand as a protective wall around them to protect them from the wiles of Satan. We've got to use our experiences to protect these kids and to protect other new Christians, babies in Christ. Otherwise, listen, our generation is going to be lost. Boy, I'm telling you, on the verge of that now. I mean, good night. I mean, you, you, see, you sit there and see the stuff that goes on in these, uh, in these uh, campaign rallies and all this other stuff, and you're sitting there going, where has this world gotten to? We're a generation away from apostasy. And the problem is this. Church folks cannot now recognize the difference between somebody who's saved and somebody who is sold out for Christ and a troublemaker. It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. And I'm not saying be a stalker. I'm not saying be this policeman. But I am saying we need to watch out. Because as folks come in, and is it, listen, we have to invest these people. We have to let them, you know, you know, we have to let them see, you know, who these people are. We have to be careful. Because I'm going to tell you something. These perverts out there would love to come to a church full of children and have their way. Amen? I'm going to tell you something. As a youth pastor of this church, I can do my best to make sure that doesn't happen. But we have to know biblically what to do. And we have to know biblically, because we ought to handle all things biblically. Amen? I get myself in the flesh a lot of times. If somebody wants to hurt my family, I know what God says. If, 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 you know, if a man slaps you on your left, you can turn to the right. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If somebody hurts my children, I'm taking a gun and blowing their brains out. Amen? And then, you know, I know what the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Amen? I know what it says. But I mean, as a man, I'm going to be uber protective of my children and uber protective of your children and your grandchildren. Amen? I, I, I think it's important. We need to look here in Romans chapter 16 and see what Paul says. It says in verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, that means he's talking to the church, he's talking to you. He's saying, I have built you, I beg you, listen to me. He's saying, I beseech you, church, say folks, listen to me. Mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and what? Avoid them. Avoid them. Mark them and avoid them. The problem is this. We get our low little clicks in church. We know that things go bad. We know even people that we love so dear, sometimes that we love so dear, they do fall off the wrong pathway. And he says this. If those people are in church and all they want to do is cause division, you mark them. You don't hang out with them. You don't join in their uh, pomp and circumstance. You don't get into a gossip game. You don't try to listen, take an ear to them. If they're going to try to cause the vision, you mark them and you avoid them. See, Brother Greg, it's, it, you're not being a friend. Their ultimate goal is to cause the vision. And most of the time, if I experience this in churches, it has to do with a power conflict. They want power. They want position. They want fame. They want something to gain their own self confidence or righteousness. And Paul says, listen, I want you to understand, church, if, you're, if you know somebody's causing division in your church, you mark them. Just make a mental note. Well, that's not right. And you avoid them. That's biblical. That's biblical. And he says, for they that are such serve not of our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by their own good words and fair speeches, Deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, let me tell you something. 
I've gone through this so many different times. It's been deacons. It's been a pastor. It's been song leaders. It's never the youth pastor. <laughs> but it's, I'm telling you, it's been trustees. I mean, it's been folks that have been in church for years and years and the Brit and the cornerstone of the churches. It's been people that you don't even expect. People that you love so dear. But they just want to say, brother, sister, I've got to tell you something. What do you think about this? And it's not like, hey, listen, we have a problem. I'm going to talk to you about this. No, it's, it's like a slithery, you know, uh, like, a, like a steak coming in the garden of Eden. They want to just gain your ear, feather you up, and then just make their opinion known in a sweet and charming way. Oh, I'm not trying to do any harm. I'm not, I'm not possibly, but I'm not trying to destroy anything. I'm not, this is kind of thinking, nothing against you, nothing against them, or nothing against the church. Or not, no, let me tell you something. What you're doing is completely wrong. If, 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 if they're just trying to call to vision, now listen, you better, you, you, listen, if you take a year of them and something's basically wrong, that's a different story. But I'm talking about somebody who is out for their own good, who wants position and power. And we all know those people. I can think of like five of them off the top of my head. They want to gain that ear. We got to be careful. These are nothing but troublemakers. And these are people that literally come in and all they want to do is stir the pot. Verse 19 says, For your obedience is come from God all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf, but I would have you wise, unto which is good and simple concerning evil. Let me tell you this. Let me start with this. Let's, 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 the, the Bible says here on uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Just, uh, Jesus said this. Beware of the false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, and inwardly they are ravening wolves. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come in to a church, and they just are awesome. You take them out to dinner. You get to know their family. You put them in a position, and the next thing you know, they want more. More, 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 more. It's never good enough until they have the, this pulpit behind them or on with them. And they're not going to stop until they get this pulpit. Boy, I, I mean, I, had, I came from a church, I'm telling you. It was tremendous. And we, we, I mean, we had 300 strong kids and everything else. And then, I'm going to tell you something, I'm going to be honest with you, man. The deacons got in there and they started not deacons. I mean, it was unbelievable warfare between, I mean, split the church right in half. Because this deacon and his crew wanted one thing, and the pastor and his people wanted another. Next thing you know, we had a business meeting, and next thing you know, I saw a hair flying. I mean, it was bad. I just kept going, I didn't say a word. I just marked them. Just trying to just learn from this. I was still pretty young. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, all their whole purpose in life is just come in there and, and cause trouble. And then and how do we know that? How do we know that a person's going to come in and just be a troublemaker? What, what is your marks? What's their deeds? Well, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20 says, They're known, wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. You ever seen a person, let's be honest, we all know these people, that are in church, hey, brother, sister, how are you, sweetie? Oh, you're such a cute boy. And next thing you know, you see them at a bar somewhere on, on Saturday night or Friday night. You know, they, they know how to play church. That person that just has that church down pat, you know? And then come the weekdays and, and, and Saturday, man, you're like, who is this guy? You know about their fruits. Amen? I mean, look, you know, if it's an apple, listen, apples go on apple trees. Amen? Now, listen, if you have a potato growing an apple tree, something's wrong. Amen? And that's, that's the problem with churches. We make an excuse like it's, oh, this is some kind of symbol from God, a potato growing on an apple tree. No, that's not normal. That's not right. You've got to you know them by their fruits. Now, let me say this. We can understand that. 
And most of us know that. But the problem is no one's bold enough to say something about that. Right. Amen? Right. Because we're not trying to cause division ourselves. Paul says, mark them and avoid them. I'm going to tell you something. You have an obligation. If somebody is doing something to cause division at Grace Chapel, it is your duty. It is your right as a, a, a person who wants to come in and enjoy the things of God, enjoy church. You have got to step up and do something about it. You recognize the fruits. You see the bad fruits. It is your job to protect this church. And if you see something that's not going right, you need to know. You need to let people know. Let your pastor know. And if it's your pastor, you let the youth pastor or somebody else who, who knows what's going on know. It's your job. These people are, decide, uh, are divisive, divisive people. These people are just, again, they're just like a hot knife through butter. They wish for to just come in, destroy, destroy, destroy. Now, how do you know that? It's because, you know what? Their actions don't line up with the word of God, period. Now, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. The problem is this. We've got too many church folks that know the word of God, but kind of make exceptions to the rule because of who they are. There's no exceptions to the Word of God. The Word of God is the Word of God. Either you're going to follow with all of it or you're going to follow with none of it. Amen? And I'm going to tell you, you can't pick and choose what verses of Scripture you want to make excuses for your lifestyle. Amen? Now listen, you're either in sin or you're right with God. Amen? I'm going to be honest with you. And you know, I'm going to tell you this right now. You cannot just, you know, just take the Word of God. You have to take the whole context. And the whole shebang of the word of God. It is there. It's it. It's the word of God. Amen? you got to take it all. And you know, these people want to pull different things and pull these verses of scriptures to fit, to fit their own standard and their own lifestyle. And they excuse their lifestyle because they saw it in Deuteronomy somewhere. They think that, oh, man, hey, that's a great rule. I'm going to take that Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse and, and just say, hey, you know, you ought to look like this. Get a haircut. No earrings. Do this. Do that. I mean, you know, and they, they start throwing all these rules and laws and everything else on people because it fits, it fits their lifestyle. It fits their standards rather than going over to the grace gospel and seeing what Ephesians talks about and Romans talks about and understand that Jesus came to fulfill the law and we live by grace. Amen. And you can't take a, a, a commandment in one law in the, in the Old Testament and not follow all 666 laws. And then you want to take one law and, because it fits your lifestyle and cause division with it. I'm going to tell you something. Pastors do that all the time because it fits their lifestyle. You have to take the whole counsel of the Word of God. And you have to know that. And I hope you understand that. But I'm going to tell you something. It can be decided divisive. It can be very divisive if we're not careful. You cannot deviate from the Word of God. Don't take the Word of God and take these subtle differences here and there. Then, not only are they divisive, but they're dishonest. They're dishonest. They're dishonest people in general. I mean, they'll lie to your face. They'll lie to you in church. I've seen it. And yet, they're teaching Sunday school. They're the youth pastor of the church. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, this list goes on for pastoring. They're dishonest people. You've got to know the word God. And you've got to learn how to handle this. And don't be afraid to do that. If they're dishonest, verse 18 tells us these people may pretend to have pure motives. And it's for the good of the church. But there's two problems with their profession. One, they're not, most of them are not even saved. Telling you this. Amen? And two, they don't care about the church. They don't care about themselves. Amen? We have to be careful around these people. They're, listen, they're deceptive. They're, just, they're divisive, they're dishonest, and they're deceptive. What they'll do is they'll do this. They'll tell you one story, and then go over and tell Debbie another story. And then they'll say, well, no, 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 I told Debbie this, Burke got that wrong. It's a telephone game. They're deceitful. They're trying to pin Debbie against Burke. Next thing you know, they're in the background going, ha, 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 ha. 
Y'all with me? I'm going to tell you, listen, as I said before, this is how Satan works. He doesn't work from the outside, he works from the inside. He works from the inside. And we have got to be careful about what we see. And listen, not only we see it, but the problem is why, the reason why churches fall is people are not, it's not like they're not seeing it. They know it's going on. They don't do anything about it. And it's a shame. Also, listen, here, we have, we have the deeds or, or the ways of the trouble, the trouble but no, we have to look at the direction. We have to look at the directions for the troublemakers. Here, Paul says this. They ought to be examined. They ought to be examined. Well, Paul says more. This comes from the word, it's a Greek word called skatos. The word mark, and it comes from a, it's a Greek word, it's skatos. Okay, where do we get that word from? What is it? Scope. Right? We gotta look at their actions. We gotta follow them. We gotta not, not stalk them, but we gotta, we gotta just mark them and observe. Mark them and observe. And let me say this the worst decisions in my life. Or when my gut told me something to do and when something was wrong and I wasn't doing the opposite anyway. Usually my gut instinct is 100% correct. And where I get in trouble is where I let my brain supersede my heart. Amen? I'm stupid here. I'm pretty smart here. But sometimes stupidity overrides my, my intelligence that God gives me here. You understand? And I get in trouble. Usually, my first impressions of people are pretty dead on. Go with your gut. Go with your instinct. Amen? You're usually right. You're usually right. But the, the, the direct, we, we have again, mark them. Mark them. And, and he says this. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to be biblical here, y'all. We have to mark them and then exclude them. These are not the people that you invite over for a Sunday dinner to your house after church is over. These are not people that you want to hang out with and go to, to King's Dominion. And these are not the people that you want to become friends with and get all buddy-buddy hunting and fishing. Because more damage is done in a social atmosphere through restaurants, fishing, hunting, things that we all have in common, that's a way for them just to get your ear full, full of stuff. And I'm going to tell you, more damage is done in those environments because we just want to hang out. We want to feel socially accepted. We won't be at home on a Friday night watching Alf on TV when we can go out and hang out and have dinner and become sociable because we never get a chance to be social. But let me call, let me call you know, Brother Flowerjaws. He has something great to say, and man, we'll spend two two hours out, and we have a great old time just talking out and having pastor for dinner. That sounds like fun. Y'all been there? Been there? Been there? Paul says, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute." You knew enough to examine their fruits. You knew enough to mark them, and now you want to hang out with them? No, no. He says, "I want you to exclude them." Exclude them because here's the deal. Their whole purpose is just one thing, very thing. It's this to get attention. To get attention. Worse than a 13 year old teenage girl. All they want is attention. Why do you think Snapchat is created? Facebook, Twitter. You know what it is? Attention. What, what is it? It's a selfie, for goodness sakes. What is that? It's all about what? Look at me. Turn all the lights on to me. If you, listen, all you're doing is doing this. Listen, you're snapping selfies for them all day long by, by doing that stuff. You're giving them the light. You're holding the camera. If you continue to want to hang around with these people. I'm, I'm serious about this, guys. We need to exclude them from the things uh, in our life. 2 Timothy 2.16 talks about it. It, it. Don't waste your time with this. Second John 10, uh, Second John 10, uh, verse 10, 11. It makes it crystal clear. You have no communication, no communion 
with these people? Let me ask you a question. Would you allow a rattlesnake in your house? Yes or no? Then why would you allow one in your church? Amen? Too many churches are playing literally with rattlesnakes in the church. Listen, I'm telling you, you start busting out rattlesnakes, I'm out of here, man. You don't play with snakes. You don't play with snakes. I'm sorry. Listen, a snake is good as dead if I see one. Don't play with it. Because you know what? First of all, you can't identify them half the time. You don't know if they're poisonous or non poisonous. If you do, good for you. You know, but the fact of the matter is, listen, if you think, you know, something like that idiot um, crocodile hunter guy who goes out and plays with snakes and all that stuff, I mean, you're a moron. I mean, you're a moron. I mean, who wants to do that? No. No. I'm not playing with snakes. But yet, we play with snakes all day long in church. We play with them. We're interested. We're captivated because it's something different. Something, oh, this is going to be juicy. This is going to be great. And it turns into a Jerry Springer episode. Listen, I have been through it. I've been through it about four different churches. And you know what? Let me say this. You say, well, things are different between this church, this church, and this church, and this church. Well, what makes us any different or any better? Nothing. We're people. Right. We have the same uh, temptations, the same attitude, the same flesh, the same desires. It's those other four churches I was part of, and they all folded because rattlesnakes got in the church. Two. Well, man, it's four churches you had. Who's, who had it all in common? Uh, it wasn't me, I promise. I, I swear. <laughs> I swear, it wasn't me. <laughs> but here's the deal. You have to explain. You have to explain. All right, here's, 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 here's what you do. How do you do this? Here's the best. Okay, I, I gave you, listen, you know now, uh, about what to do. Now, here's some defense that you have to do, okay? First of all, you have to, here's how you defend this, okay? You mark them, you exclude them, and then you have to understand you have to be committed to God's word. Paul says here, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which hold the division uh, and offense is contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned. Which ye have learned. To become strong, to become uh, you know, uh, suitable to fight this off, you have to know the word of God. You have to get in and, and study your Bible, and you have to get involved in, uh, in, in through the word. Uh, and, uh, uh, the word literally means here you have to be obedient to the word of God and uh, to, to fight this mess off. I'll be honest with you. The situation that, that took a hand with one church, you know, I was listening to all this stuff that was going on. And all this uh, willingness to overthrow the pastor and do this and do that. And, you know, this was happening at 12 o'clock at night. And I just couldn't believe how stuff was going on. And I left. I was mad as a boy. And all I did was this. I pulled this Bible over. I said, Lord, you're going to show me because something's just ain't clicking here. It does not matter my opinion of what I think of the situation. It's only you can only take that situation and, and that matter and, and and look at the word of God and, and compare it to what goes. You have to take that situation into into account and go to the word of God, and that's and that's what answers everything. There should be a commitment to the word of God to listen to it. You have to listen to it being preached, being taught, being mentioned, being read. Listen to it. Don't just listen as the, as the, as whoever's reading the word of God. Sometimes it just sounds like mumbo jumbo and, and mumbling and everything else because you've heard it over and over and over again. There's meanings behind this word. This word is alive. Amen? As, as, as the, the word is being read, listen, absorb it, listen to it, and then learn it. It's one thing to listen to it, it's another thing to learn it. If somebody told you two plus two equals five, what are you gonna say? Huh? No. You listen to what I had to say, right? But two plus two is four. Why? Because you learned it. Amen? Now, if somebody comes up here and says, the preacher goes, well, I'm here to tell you this. I heard from God. Oh, man, God just gave me a great revelation. And I'm going to tell you all folks right now, listen, that's pastor of your church. 
Two plus two is five. Because God said so. Now, what would you think? You know what most churches do? Yeah, you're right, Pastor. God said to you, you're right. Two plus two is five. I'm going to be honest with you, man. Listen, how many times have you been in the business meeting and you know something's not right? You know something's not right. But because you're going against the grain and you're going against the crowd, everybody wins 100%. Great. Because pastor said 2 plus 2 equals 5. Y'all get what I'm saying? You have to listen to the word of God and you have to learn the word of God. And not only that, you have to act upon the word of God. You need to know it's right. It's one thing to know it's right. It's another thing to act upon it. Be bold enough to do it. You have to live it. There's another step. Listen, learn, live it. Live it. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to take, let me tell you this right now. I'm not going to take biblical advice from somebody that I know who is not saved. I'm not going to take biblical advice so I know somebody that is not living by the word of God. But yet you got people that will literally go on TV, listen to some preacher on TV, and they have so much great inspiration. They live their daily lives because so-and-so said this on Twitter or so-and-so said this on TV because they take that word of God out. Let me tell you something. I don't care. If Obama no, – no, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Yeah. We said this, I'll never go to a rock and Bible study. Amen? But we'll just leave it at that. I'm going to tell you something. You have to live it. If I'm going to take advice, if I'm going to take uh, you know, uh, uh, some, some uh, inspiration, or if I'm going to take uh, some advice from somebody who's a, a godly person, yes, who's living their life and battling the same things I'm doing, I have a lot more respect for that person. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going I'm I'm to listen to that more so than I am anybody else. So he's, when he says, listen, I want you to take the word of God. I want you to listen to it. I want you to learn it. I want you to live it. And he says, he says this, I want you to be Christ-like towards good works. You have to be Christ-like towards good works. It is so hard. Boy, I'm going to tell you this right now. Y'all y'all with me. Just hang on. It is so hard. It is so hard. Listen, when things go bad, when things make you mad, and things are happening all around you. It feels like your whole Lego house that you built is falling down to be Christ-like. In it, I'm going to tell you something. There's been times, I'm going to be honest with you, I want to choke and kill and slaughter people that are local Christians because they've done the unthinkable to myself and my family. And I'm going to tell you something. As a man, I got the flesh, and I had some nasty thoughts of what I'm going to do to these people. Polishing my back, uncovering my golf clubs. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just telling you. I'm just being honest with you. I don't think God would have blessed me if I took a baseball bat. Somebody said. Amen? It's not good. He says, mark them. Avoid them. But do it in a Christ-like manner. Tell you this, the hardest thing for me to do is do this. You know what got me through those times? You pray for your enemies. You pray and you ask the blessings upon their life. You, I mean, like you pray for them like they're your best friend. You love them to death. I'm going to tell you, it's the hardest thing to do. Because in the back of your mind, like, oh, Lord, I hate this person. But Lord, bless them. Lord, give them, you know, you know, bless them. I know they're going through this problem. I know they're going through this thing. But Lord, listen, the Bible says, you know, it shall rain upon the just and unjust to say, Lord, for you to bless me and me to get over my ministry, my hurt. My, and you, if I'm going to continue to work in your ministry and you for me, for you to bless me, Lord, I ask you to bless them. Woo! I'm going to tell you something. It's hard to do. You've got to be the bigger person. 
And you got to step up and get them causing division. Get them doing the wrong things. Get them tearing your church apart. God bless them. Boy, I'm going to tell you, it is so hard to do. But you have got to be the more mature Christian and step up and be the Christ like person. Because you know what? It's not about you, it's about the other person. It's about those who are new Christians. They're going to see how you're going to handle the situation, how you're going to handle that, that thing that's going on in life. And they're going to look to you. What are you going to do? You're going to fold? Or are you going to be that Christ like person? That example that, that Paul was, that the Christ was, and the disciples were to others. He says, bless them. Be that Christ-like person. Be wise. Be skilled. <laughs> because these kids are going to look at how you handle that. I don't know about you, man. Listen, I don't ever want to see my kids. Listen, if Tony said something to me, and here he is, you know, I'm sitting there, he said something bad about me. I take that chair, I take that chair, and I slap him across the head. And the next thing you know, it's WWE all over the place here. And, um, <laughs> and uh, my kids, they're not going to be like, go, daddy, go! No. They'll be like, Whoop. And for the rest of their life, they're always going to remember their daddy taking a chair to Tony's head in church. They'll be scarred for life. That's not how it is, but you know what? There's no difference. Because I'm going to tell you something. I, listen, I haven't seen you know like fight like you know like this fight from church close. But I haven't seen that you know. But I'm I'm telling you, I, I the memories I have the most of church usually are not the good things. It's usually the bad things. Remember those business meetings that got on. Remember those arguments that got on. It's scarred in the back of my head because those things were handled in a Christ-like manner. Now I'm gonna tell you. We always remember the bad things. We're going to be wise and we're going to be skilled. I, I, I want to say this. I don't know if be careful when I say this, but we have to be childlike toward the, the guilty ways of the person. It means this. Kids can fight and kids can argue and kids will literally wrestle each other in the mud one day. And then that evening, they're playing basketball together. You understand that? Adults today are not talking to people for 20 years because somebody called them a bad name. Or somebody had said something about them, you know, 100 years ago. Or somebody had, or it was just hearsay and everything else. We hold grudges, don't we? For life! You cannot be childlike. In, 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 in a, in a Christ-like manner, if you've got grudges today. And I'm going to tell you this. Hopefully you don't have any grudges with anybody in your church. Because I'm going to be honest with you. The preacher can do all he can to get this ministry going and going and going. But if there's grudges being held against anybody that's at that church or not at that church, God will not bless it. You have got to be childlike. As the kids come running with Christ and the disciples try to push them back, he says, listen, I want you to have faith just like that child. It compares our faith to that child because they can get over things. We can't. If that person is decided, the license, if that person has got the temperament, and that person either needs to be marked and excluded. But if he, get, he repents and he does everything biblically, or she does everything biblically, you become childlike, and you forgive, and you play in the sandbox. Amen? The problem is, we can't forgive. And churches get hindered, and churches can't last over a major dispute because they can't forgive. And they can't forget. We've got to be children, folks. We've got to be children. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to agree with you. You're not going to agree with me on some things, some major decisions that we have to make here in the future. And we might fight. We might agree. But I'm going to tell you this right now. We have children. Amen? We can agree to disagree, but let's all play in the sandbox called Great Grace Chapel and have a good time. Amen? I'm going to tell you, things are going to happen, and I can't wait. 
and see what the Lord has in store for us. But let me say this. If that person's not going to repent of it, if that person refuses to admit or continues to just destroy themselves, you know what you do? You let them destroy themselves. We'll take something. You let someone, I'll tell you, you walk on hard eggs all long enough, you're going to get yoga in the Amen? You're going to let, this person's going to fall. We'll tell you something. That is the work of Satan and Satan himself. As far as I know, the story does not end well with Satan. Amen? Do you understand this? Satan is a copycat, tries to copycat God. He is nowhere near God. Amen? God is the creator. Satan is the copycat. Amen? God is the only one who can create. Satan tries to imitate. Amen? And he's always trying to get physical, material things in front to, 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 to entice people to do different things. I'll give you an example. When Jesus was walking for 40 days, 40 nights, and he was trying to tempt, when he was trying to tempt Jesus, Satan tried to give him things. I'll give you the kingdom. I'll give you this. I'll give you that. Materialistic things. He would have none of it. You know what? Because our home is not here, folks. Our home's in heaven. Amen. We're going to continue to fight Satan and fight the things of Satan. Because I'm going to tell you this right now. Hey, Satan's going to use people and use people and use people. But you know what? Just as Satan falls, God's not going to allow this to continue on. You cannot go against God and God's will and not have consequences. Just wait. You might go through that storm. You might pray blessings on them. But if they continue in their ways, you mark this down. They will be destroyed. Not because of what you did. Because God Took care of the problem already. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Amen? Is that what the Bible says? Yes. Don't get in God's way of vengeance. Because your vengeance can't compare to what God can do today. Amen? It's tough. But you know what? God doesn't need a bodyguard. He's got this. He's got this. But your job is to pray. Pray that they have a repent of heart. You be childlike, you be Christ-like. Because there's a storm brewing. I don't know what it's going to be. It may be 10 years down the line. It might be 10 days down the line. But we're going to be dealing with some problems. Because we're a bunch of people. And we've got to go to the Word of God. And we have to understand as a people how to handle things. Because man, there's troublemakers who are going to be coming in. It happens at every church. It happens at every church. It's just a warning. We might not need it now. We might need it five to ten years down the line. Hopefully we can remember what the Word of God says here in Romans chapter 16. You mark them. You mark them and avoid them. <laughs> you pray for them. Amen? If we have disagreements, let's become children. Amen? Christ God. God's against you. That is a su successful. And I wish I would have known that. I wish I would have known that four churches ago. <laughs> Amen? I wish I would have known that and learned that four churches ago. Because who knows where this church would be then? Or the second one. Or the third one. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you this right now. We've got to learn from our mistakes, folks. We can't let this continue to happen over and over and over and over again. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for just uh, still in our hearts what we need to do. And Lord, just come up with a, an action plan when things just don't go our way. Lord, I do ask you for a hedge protection around this church. I do ask for, uh, Lord, your blessings. And Lord, when it, when it does rise and Satan does fight us, Lord, sends people uh, our way and just wants to call, cause divisive uh, issues and wants to go against the word of God, wants to go against uh, what we have going on here as a ministry of Grace Chapel. And Lord, that we as a people would understand who they are, give us the wisdom to handle it. And Lord, just again, Bless us through that time. We might not need it now. Lord, I know, I know that there's going to be a day coming and we're going to need this message. Lord, I ask you for grace and mercy. Help us through it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.